Welcome, everyone. Thank you. We're really in for a, a real treat. This topic really touches my heart. If I can just spend one or two minutes explaining why um, I appreciate your patience. Um, first of all, many people don't understand what prophecy even is. And I'm going to give you an example, something I, I being in yeshivas my whole life, I never had a problem learning Navi, learning the five books of Moses. And I recently was at a class, and I heard, I heard this as a rumor, that certain people don't learn Navi. And a, and, and a teacher, a very um, advanced Kolel student, announced to his students that he doesn't learn Navi, his teacher told him not to learn Navi, because if he couldn't understand certain things, that he should stay far away from it. Uh, the truth is, if you're learning in yeshiva and, and you're learning Gemara, so how can you not come across psukim of the five books? Of course you're going to. And you're going to come across many psukim in the writings and the prophets. And you have to understand them. You can't understand the pshat and the Gemara. You can't understand the sugya. You can't understand the outcome or even halakha lamaisa without understanding the basic ideas behind prophecy. So the group that I learned with in the morning were actually learning um, the Rambam's Hakdama Leperish Mishnayis on prophecies, the second chapter. And we're getting a, a bit like we're, we're sinking our teeth into what prophecy really is. But the other reason why it's very important is because we're living it. If you're living in Israel, I guess anywhere in the world, and you open up the newspaper and you see Israel on the headlines, it, you're living with prophecy in your midst. And um, I, I chose three very short verses just to show you that there are certain prophecies that are extremely relevant. And first of all, they're maybe because they're more, more dear to my heart. But uh, what I see happening in the world, and I'm sure that our speaker tonight is going to speak about it, to mention it, not only are the, hopefully, the lost tribes coming back, and there's much to be said about that, and I'm going to leave that to, uh, to Rabbi Harry, but there's so many Gentiles who are being awoken and are leaving the church in droves, probably is going to happen with Islam as well. Um, in chapter 53 of Isaiah, very famous chapter, the nations declare, who would believe what we have heard? From whom has the arm of Hashem been revealed? If you don't see the Jewish people returning and in the headlines, for good or for bad, Mi amin lishma'atenu uzro Hashem amin niglata. I mean, you can see it, and they're declaring that they see it, and the next thing they're going to say is, we have been fed lies, our, in our ancestors passed down untruths to us. And as a result, if you look in Zechariah 8, chapter 8, verse, I think it's 23, thus has a, says Hashem, Master of Legions, in those days it will happen that ten men, of all the different languages of the nations will take hold. They will take hold of the corner of the garment of a Jewish man saying, let us go up, let us go with you. We have heard that God is with you. And uh, I have several uh, Facebook pages that are geared specifically towards this uh, endeavor to teach Torah, not only to, of course, Jews and then the lost tribes, but to anybody who's open. Um, just to quote the Pasuk in Hebrew, and then to end off, in Joel, this is the beginning of chapter 3, because we're, we're going to, we, the rabbi is going to introduce us to the geopolitical situation today. And we're talking about the nations around the world understanding what's going to happen. But what about us? Are we going to understand what's going to happen? And this is in Joel chapter 3. And it will happen after this that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your elders will dream prophetic dreams, and your young men will see visions. <laughs> Basar, Venivu, 
זה נחם, חלמוס, חלמון, בחוריכם, חזיונוס, יירו. So, when you're walking through the streets of Yerushalayim, you meet all kinds of interesting people. If you go to the Bate Midrashos, you meet even more interesting people, all kinds of people. And uh, there's somebody that I keep running into in my neighborhood, and I, I've engaged Harry in many conversations, and I think we're on the same page in a lot of ways, and we associate with the same teachers and rabbis, and uh, I think you'll be... Uh, I think we're very happy, and Bizrat Hashem will have time at the end for answer, for questions and answers. And just to remind you to turn off your cell phones. Without any further ado, Harry Rosenberg. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Amen. Amen. Appreciate everyone coming tonight. Actually, um, just today I got over a three-day virus. I haven't eaten in three days. So I kind of feel like Esther before, you know, before she goes for the king, she fasted. But obviously in this case, I don't feel like my death's at hand if I don't impress everyone in the room. <clears throat> but I'm going to give it my all. Uh, I'm going to start off tonight just giving a little background of myself and how I got into the field we're going to discuss. And then we're going to go into a few different topics after that. So it may start off seeming like a story, but then it's going to get into very heavy information. I had, a, first of all, I'm a descendant of the Vilna Gon, um, and randomly about 10 years ago, I had this, I was in New York City, I had this strong calling and a strong vision to get land in Israel. I didn't know why or what I was supposed to do with it, but I had this feeling. And simultaneously, I was reading a Sefer, a book called Im Habanim Smecha by Rabbi Teichtel, an incredible book, it speaks about all the whole generation that we're up against right now and really decoding it. And he gave a piece of advice for anyone who wants to get land in Israel. And he said, this is guaranteed to work. So I'm going to tell it to you guys right now because I hope everyone else can implement it. He said there's a, there's a word in Hebrew called the teshukaf, uh, desire. And he said, uh, just like the mother calf has more of a desire to give the baby calf milk, then the baby calf has a desire to receive the milk. We would all think it's the opposite. He says the rain has more of a desire to give the land its water than the land has to receive it. We would think it's the opposite. So they said the heavens today have a strong desire to settle the children of Israel in the land of Israel, more than we know, more than we want. So it said, we have to learn how to tap into that want, and the, the, the heavens will help us. So basically he said, what you have to do is when people complain to God, they say, God, how come you didn't bless me? We say, God doesn't bless humans. He blesses their handiwork, what they do with their hands. So he says, create a vessel. And whatever vessel you create, if it's with a group of like-minded people who are very close with each other and have a lot of love with each other, it's guaranteed success. And if it's geared towards settling the land of Israel, unconditional, it's going to succeed. So I said, that's great. That's all we have to do, you know? So I gathered a few of my closest friends in a room, great guys, and we said, let's come up with an idea of what we're going to do to settle the land of Israel and get land. Uh, first friend of mine said, let's start a brewery. We said, okay, that's a great idea. We all like beer. People like beer. We'll get, we'll get some land. We'll build a brewery and it'll work. So we booked the first flight to Israel, and we drove around the Galil to every Moshav and Kibbutz in the north looking for uh, a place to build a brewery. Obviously a lot of politics, but there were a lot of empty Kibbutzim and empty Moshavs, and we'd go to them and say, hey, you guys want a bunch of young Americans to come volunteer and work? We'll put some capital in and help you. They said, yeah, it sounds like a good idea to me, but there's 30 people in the Kibbutz who also need to approve of this, and you have to have meetings with each one. They also have their own vision, what they want to do there. Maybe build a hotel one day, maybe not. And so we got passed around from place to place. And uh, throughout our journey, we heard that there were two tribes in Israel, from the lost tribes of Israel, which we'll get into, who came back to Israel with ancient beer recipes. This was the Ethiopians and the Bnei Menashe from India. The Ethiopians came back with a drink called Tej, a honey brew, and the, and the Bnei Menashe from India came back with a drink called Zoo. It's like a type of a rice sake. And so the first thing I did, I stopped the first Ethiopian I saw on the street, and I said, hey, excuse me, sir, uh, do you have a, tri a tribal leader in your tribe or someone I could speak to? And he said, sure, here's the, the leader of our tribe, here's his number. So I called the, the leader, I said, excuse me, you don't know me, but I'm from New York, and uh, I have this idea, I'd like to make your recipes. And he said, okay, please, come on, I'll introduce you to our brewmaster. You know, next thing you know, we're the, with an elderly lady who the, traditionally the brewmasters of their tribes. What was it? Oh, no problem. And uh, we learned the recipe. And so while we were going around shopping for land in Israel, we realized... Uh, this is a very long, uh, difficult process. We're not going to get land in the next month or two, but we're here. We're stuck in New York City. We got a great company name. We got a great brand. Let's start the company in New York City, and when Israel re land ready, we'll move it over there. 
So that's what we did. We started a company in New York City called Lost Tribes Beverage, and we started making these recipes, and we were in New York City, and it happened to be a lot of these big startup companies in New York City are all owned by young Jews in their 20s and 30s, and so it was very beneficial for us to network, and our beer got everywhere in the city, and it was really popular, and we had a lot of fun. And this is not the purpose of the story, but because of this, I'll tell you what happened. Anyone who typed in at this period of time, I don't know what it is today, this was about eight, nine years ago, who typed in the words lost tribes in Google, our company was coming up first. And all of a sudden, we started getting emails from around the world from people saying, hey, we're from the lost tribes of Israel. From India, from Africa, from Afghanistan, Japan, you name it. It was coming in like every day from all, and I said, this is, this is crazy, what's going on? Because I was in yeshiva, I was a student, I was studying Torah, I had no clue what anyone was talking about. I thought the only remnants of the people of Israel were the Jewish people. So who were these people, the lost tribes of Israel? So I said I needed to do a little research. So the first thing I did is I ordered all the books on Amazon that dealt with the topic. I got a little more interested, I started calling professors, emailing people, reaching out, really getting to know the subject. And as I'm reading these books, uh, in, for example, I'll tell you, one of the main regions we're getting emails from was Afghanistan. So I'm reading these books in Afghanistan, and the tribes in Afghanistan are basically named after the ten tribes of Israel. They, they only marry within their tribes. You have the major clans, are uh, the, the Shinwari, the Rubaini, the Gadi, the Afridi, the, Le the Levani, and the, one of the major ones is the Yosef Zai. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Yosef Zai. It means children of Yosef. If anyone knows who won the, the Nobel Peace Prize a few years ago, it was Malala Yosef Zai. She was from the Ten Tribes of Israel, who was on the front cover of Time Magazine, who won the Nobel Peace Prize. The people who were able to put that together at the time were blown away, but most of the Jewish nation had no clue what was really going on. It was a, a mind-blowing thing, and it was a sign also. Uh, we'll go into other traditions and customs in Afghanistan shortly, because it is uh, fascinating. So the first thing I did, when I was in yeshiva at the time, so I had deactivated my Facebook account, because nothing good was coming from it, uh, I said, I'm going back to Facebook, and I'm going to start searching these names of these tribal people and see if they're on Facebook. So I'm typing on Facebook, Yosef Zai, Rubaini, Gadi, and all of a sudden, you know, 30-year-olds in Afghanistan are popping up. So I said, let me, let me friend them and ask them. And so I'm sending a message and say, hey, is it true? Are you from the Lost Tribes of Israel? And each time, 100% of the time, they all said, yes, my grandparents told me that I am. And this wasn't like a few guys. I, I must have had a few hundred contacts over a few month period where I was just building a, a network and, and going into it. Yeah, it's very heavy stuff. Sorry. So then all of a sudden I'm like, you know, I'm learning about this, I'm creating contacts around the world, and I'm, I'm sending messages, they're messaging me, and I said there has to be something we could do about this to take it to the next level. And so what, we, what I did was like, I thought an idea and I pitched to a foundation, it was called the iTribe, which is a digital non-for-profit, non it's a social network, a map of the world, where people around the world who self-identify as being from the tribes of Israel can log themselves in and self-identify as being from the tribes. So what we did is we, we made it live and all of a sudden regions started getting populated. And I want to discuss with you tonight the two major regions that have been populating this website and the political implications of their, uh, you know, their presence in this Israelite narrative. Um, if anyone has any questions, I also don't mind the hands being raised because if there's a camera, I'll repeat the question. Uh, this is going to be a lot going. So what we did is we created this website, and when people started registering, they started uploading their information, their content, so we were learning about them as well. Uh, so for example, in Afghanistan, uh, the Pashtuns, that's what they're called, they've been living there for exactly about 2,600 years, that's where they date them, just about 100 years of the tribes of Israel going into exile. The tribes went into Israel, uh, the exile 722 before the common era, 20, you know, uh, and, and then the, the Afghanistan people founded around the year 600-something in Afghanistan. And we know the tribes were exiled to the Far East. Now, besides just their names, they have a lot of other traditions, uh, like they do with circumcision on the eighth day, unlike other people around them. They eventually were forced converted to Islam, but they hold their own code called Pashtun Wali, which is, that's the, if you Google Pashtun Wali, you learn. It's basically the code of the law of Moses, uh, which is the, the written law without the oral law softening it. Because by the time the tribes went into Israel, they didn't have a Mishnah or a Talmud, they didn't have the oral law. So they had these very harsh Israelite codes that they've kept. A lot of the tribes out there, they wear four-cornered garments with tassels, they have side locks, they all cover their heads. They're the only Muslim people that when they learn the Koran, they, uh, they shuckle like this. Um, yeah, this is, these are known facts. Uh, some, some people even light candles under baskets on Friday. Uh, so all these things. So we actually sent out a survey, a, a data poll to these regions, and we pulled uh, from different 
regions of Afghanistan. We pulled a lot of data from them, asking them questions about their customs and traditions, aligning it with Israelite customs and traditions. And the evolution of that is we've created a Facebook group just for Jews and Pashtuns to start talking and sharing and dialoguing. So if anyone in this room wants to tonight have a conversation with the people of Afghanistan, they could just easily join this Facebook group and see what, the, what dialogue is going on between a few hundred Afghans and a few hundred Jews already uh, as a result of this. So this was in Afghanistan. I'd like to go now into one other region and then we'll swoop back into why this is all relevant. Because the biggest part of this whole thing is if so, so what? You know, so I'm telling you all this crazy stuff, so what are we going to do about it? What's the next step? The next biggest place in the world today that you're, and we'll talk about other minor places where you see the tribe service, but the next biggest place in the world today is in Nigeria, where you have people claiming to be from the Israelites. This is in, well, Nigeria is not the, the proper name they would refer to it, but it's the Igbo tribe uh, in Biafra, which was once Biafra. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of them or familiar with them. They number about 40 million people in the southern tip of Nigeria, and they also have a, a, a ton of customs and traditions that completely align with the Torah, and they have a, a, a few million practicing Igbo today, uh, practicing Jews who, and you know, so if you also, if you go on Facebook, you'll see them uploading pictures of them praying with, with Talit and Tefillin, and they have Torahs, and they're very, very, very dedicated. Now I'd like to go into one thing, before we go into other tribes, just w what the political aspects of this whole thing are. Now, here's where it gets a little heavy. So now we're looking at this map, and you have Afghanistan, you have Israel, and you have uh, Nigeria, and you're, and you're seeing these are the largest places in the world today that are identifying as the Jewish, or the people from Israel. The word Jewish is the wrong term. Why? What does the word Jewish mean? It means you're from, from Yehuda, from the Judean exile. We became, the first time you really see it used is with um, Mordechai and Esther. We refer to Mordechai uh, Ishimini, we refer to in the, in the beginning of the, of the Megillah, which means the man, a man from uh, Benjamin. But he's also referred to as Yehudi Ishi. So he was from Benjamin, but he classified it as Yehuda, because we say the tribes of Yehuda are compiled by Benjamin, Levi, and Judah. So this is why we call Jewish. So when we refer to these people in Afghanistan and Nigeria, someone says, are they Jewish? Can you count them in a minion? For now, it's not, we don't have to get religious, because this is a family. If you find that you have a long-lost cousin on the other side of the world, you didn't get in touch, the first thing you ask is how many times a day are you praying? No, you say, are you okay? Do you have food? Do you have what you need? That's the first logical approach. So now that we have these tribes surfacing, that's the approach we're going to take as well. So now I want to say, I want to say something really interesting, which most people don't notice. Um, in Afghanistan, they're destabilized. They have, uh, I don't know if people, or if the kind of people in this room are familiar with the politics of what, what happened there in the last 40, 50 years, but Afghanistan was once uh, a little bit larger than it is now, and the British came in and drew a line, basically right down the middle of it, called the Durand Line. And there's Pashtuns living on both sides of this line, and it destabilized the region. A lot of them are in refugee camps, growing up very impoverished, and then you have Saudi funds coming in and radicalizing them into radical Islam. Uh, but the older tribal elders are very upset about this because they say, well, this is not our way of practicing. We're really, they call themselves Bani Israel. If you Google the words Bani Israel, only one people come up, that's them. Uh, that's what they refer to themselves. They say, this is not us. We need to be rebuilt up again. But right now we can't because we've been thrown into this place called Pakistan, which is not our homeland. And we're not ruling over ourselves anymore and we have no rights anymore. This happened, this line that they drew, which destabilized the whole entire region, happened within three or four months of the British coming to Israel and drawing the green line right up the middle here. Within three or four months. So all of a sudden, you know, my brain works with like the neurological pathways. I start making connections. I say, wait a minute, okay. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to touch Israel politics. One state, two state, we'll get to that. But I'm like, I just see a, a bigger common denominator. That lines that have destabilized Israel have also destabilized the other people that claim to be from the ten tribes of Israel during the same few months of each other. And then I looked into it even farther. Nigeria wasn't Nigeria. There was the Yoruba tribe in the north, and the south was called Biafra, which was Igbo land. Yes, and, and uh, the British came in oh, before the, you know, I think early, earlier 1900s, but they came in and they drew, a new, they drew a new line and said, this is now Nigeria. Biafra and Igbo, you are no, no longer autonomous over yourselves. Now other people are going to rule over and also created chaos and war for them. In the 1960s, the Igbo tried to go independent. They tried to become an independent state again. And there was actually a genocide, a holocaust. Uh, most people don't talk about this holocaust. But there was an actual holocaust against them where millions and millions of people were killed and starved. And I believe this is a, not a secret, but it's not publicly spoken about, that Israel was the one that came and broke that blockade um, against the Igbo. They came with their jets and they brought, I, what, what, I don't know the details of the military operation, but they were the ones who broke the, the blockade on them. They brought them food and et cetera and helped save them. Now today, the Igbo are again trying to go independent. They are trying to become an independent nation again in Biafra, and it's a very strong movement, and it looks like it probably will happen. 
the leader of the free Biafra movement today shows up to all his events when he gets to, has to go to court for treason and stuff. He shows up with a talus on his head, a four-corner talus with strings. This is not, I'm not making this up. Everyone, I, I always appreciate people go to Google and Google what I'm saying because the internet's full of the information that you can cross-check and make sure this is not a, a hocus-pocus conspiracy theory. And so now we have a, a bigger scenario. I say three places that the British drew lines, that they destabilized, are all claiming to be from the people of Israel and are now locking arms and creating a common voice between themselves. And there's power in that. So all of a sudden when people come to me and they start talking about one state, two state solutions, I said you have the total wrong context right now. You have no clue what's really going on in the bigger picture. Because it's not about Israel, one state, two state. It's about lines that third party people came and drew and, and, and created instability. Now, we, I personally, I have no problem with uh, Arabs and Muslims. I hang out with them all the time when I see them in the street. And I feel, you know, high five in, I have friends. That's not the issue. The people can get along. But when you put leaders with jobs who need high salaries in charge of lines that someone else drew, that's going to create a whole uh, mechanism of uh, unsta instability. So what the future will look like, I'd like to start to begin to speak about that now, because this, this comes back to the if so, so what? If so, what that you're 40 million people in Nigeria, 25 million people in Afghanistan who all claim this? And I'll tell you one other very interesting thing before I go further into this, is that uh, there's about, they say, some people say higher numbers, I'm going to go conservative, about 30% of the Palestinians in Israel uh, have Jewish blood. And, and yeah, they have Jewish blood. Not only that, the first, uh, the first prime ministers wrote about this of Israel. And the, sc the scary thing is a high percentage of terrorist attacks actually come from these people. So there's a few questions we could ask. How is that the case? And we say very clearly, first of all, they, we were taught when the Israel became a state, a lot of these people reached out to rejoin the Jewish people and were denied. And this created a big resentment in them. And secondly, they're, they're persecuted by other Muslims called fake uh, Arabs, that like you're not really an Arab, like you're a Murano, so to say, like it's a, it's a derogatory term. So psychologically, they don't have, they don't fit in anywhere. So they're trying to fit in so hard in their Arab communities, they go to such extremes to do terrorist attacks uh, here to show, no, look, we're not Jews, we hate Jews. Look, we're really you. And so they're it's psychologically uh, damaging, and they need, they, you know, there's got to be a therapy involved in that. Uh, so what happened was we started also mapping out villages in Israel, so we can now pinpoint which villages are from these people. Uh, you know, we can, if, are we, do we have contacts on the ground? Can we message them? Can we pull data from them? And this is a, and it's a whole network. So now what's the future of this, of this whole thing I'd like to go into? Um, some people in the room may know what I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to debrief. It was a mission about 50, 60 years ago in Israel. You have a question? Yes. Can you, I mean, is it possible theoretically to do genetic testing? Genetic testing, have, first of all, has been done on the Palestinians and Jews, and we're extremely, or we've already figured out, we're extremely, extremely similar. Genetic testing is difficult, though, because we don't have the ancient Israelites mapped out to map out today. For example, they say the Ashkenazim came from a few hundred families uh, only, and, we're, and when you look at the, the book of Ezra and Nehemia, only a very small population of the people actually came back to the land. We're like a remnant of a remnant of a remnant of people. Uh, most people today could trace back to like the, you know, to Rashi or the, we're a very small population. The Kohen gene and the, and the Levi gene, that would be interesting. I don't know if we've done the, because we do have a Y chromosome uh, for, the, for the Kohanim. If we would do that in the Palestinian villages, that would be very fascinating. Um, that's a good question. Uh, so let me take a sip and we'll go forward. So the question is, if so, so what? So do we do about all this stuff? In the, there was a movement in Israel, uh, I don't know the exact year, started in the 1940s, was 1950s, and 19, maybe it ended in the late 1950s, it was called Choma Umigdal. Um, you don't have to give me a nod if you know what I'm talking about, because I'll say what it is. It was called the Wall and Tower Movement. It was basically, um, they were trying to build cities in Israel in the north, young Jewish pioneers, and Arabs kept coming and burning down the cities, so they weren't able to build them. So what they did was they would show up to a plot of land with a prefabricated wall, and a tower, and teepees. And they would set up a base camp overnight with a wall, a tower, and teepees, a lot of them, and they would, you know, for a few weeks they start to build up, and we have about 50 or 60 major kibbutzim and, and moshavs in the north that are based off of this model, Choma mm -hmm. uh, Omegdal. It was a very successful operation. So it was pre basically like a prefabricated pop-up community. Now the question is, um, <clears throat> 
what do we do about this going forward and how does it have to do with that? So what I had, not me, but I have a team of people I work with, but our idea is to kind of say, let's do Choma O Migdal 2.0 and go back, to the, go back to the main point. If you have these lost tribes around the world, the first thing we're doing is not to find out what religion they are or convert them to Judaism or try to get the right of return. Right now there are organizations in Israel who are doing amazing work converting some of the lost tribes and bringing them back to Israel. But the way I look at it, there could be a few hundred million people that have a claim of Zeri Israel, which is a real term in halacha. If you go to Wikipedia and type in Zeri Israel, it'll tell you it's a halachic status of someone who's a descendant of the people of Israel, but not from a Jewish mother, and they have a, a claim to be forced back into the people. You ha you're actually obligated to convince it to come back in, as opposed to someone who just wants to convert. So they're not fully a non-Jew, they're not fully uh, someone we, we're going to be in a minion with yet. So, so we have this, you know, this whole, this whole entire picture here, and so we say the first thing we're going to do is not give them religion. We have to give them sustenance and sustainability. Israel right now is leading the world in e ecological technology and sustainable technology. All types of technology you can imagine, Israel is leading the world. So on our network, on, this, on the iTribe that we built with each village there, there's going to be an option to click on each village and donate or sponsor to bring them a prefabricated pop-up sustainable city, basically, with, which means your electricity production, your water filtration, growing, growing your food, etc. You know, there's uh, different types of uh, products out there today that we could prefab all these things in like a little shipping container that you drop out of the sky, and next thing you know, you're giving them electricity, clean water, and life. And so this whole Mount McDowell thing, which built 60 communities in the north, I saw that as a prototype for something that can scale out to the future of these people. So now what I see is, is going to be happening, if, for example, if you look at the Bnei Menashe, the, the people of India who came back to Israel, they have their own militia, their own army, and they put the flag of Israel on the ground. They have their own Israeli army outfits with the Jewish star, and they have the, and the same thing in Nigeria. They're, they're, they're declaring that this is Israel too. They're putting the flag on the ground. They're saying this is Israel. So now you have regions with m large amounts of people, mass amounts of people calling themselves Israel who are looking towards us, towards the Jews to say, now what? What do we do now? We're looking at you. We want to be involved in this whole thing. And the Jewish people here, you know, we're, we're kind of arguing on our own uh, mini issues without looking at the bigger picture saying, hey, the big picture could save the little things that we're trying to nitpick about. Uh, so what I see the future going with this is certain borders that have been created by the British, which all over from here to Afghanistan are going to slowly reshift and reshape based on people's loyalty towards Israel. And I don't believe you're going to bring everyone from Afghanistan back to Israel. I believe you're going to bring Israel to Afghanistan. And I'm going to see this with a lot of places around the world, and we'll get into that. <coughs> so when I speak, when we're saying this is about prophecy and geo geopolitics, the, the two are the same because in the future we say the borders of Israel are going to spread. Now, is that through like tanks and airplanes, we're going to come conquer you? How's that going to happen? No. It's going to be people raising their hands and saying, we are from Israel, we want to be involved. And in the, in Rav Tzadok, I believe, Rav Tzadok HaKohen, in the, a great stage, says, in the future, the world becomes Israel, and Israel becomes Jerusalem. That's what he says. So when you speak about a global Israel, this is not a, a right-wing type of thing. This is a humanitarian thing, where this is a humanitarian mission. <clears throat> and once we get to world peace and all this stuff, then we can talk about religion. We can talk about the Afghans, you know, what religion did you guys end up keeping after this time? We ought to go back into it, and et cetera. Uh, so this is really basically the, the main frame of this. I'd like to extend beyond um, Africa and, and Afghanistan towards the east and the west and speak about for a little bit <clears throat> other people that are going to be involved in this uh, great and gathering. Any questions in the meanwhile? Mm -hmm. This isn't a question, it's a, a comment. Please. That as you possibly know, in the South Canton Hills, there are a large number of so-called Arabs, in fact, who are of Jewish ancestry and still practicing Jewish customs. In, especially, I think, in Khalkun, and there are other communities like that. Um, and uh, their position with regard to Islam, I think, is very ambivalent. They, they're, not, they're not, not really in and they're not really out. Yes, this is correct. So for our maps and our data that we've pulled, the majority of them are showing up around the South Hebron Hills. He's, he's referring to the Arab... Um, the word is not really Arab. There's no such thing as an Arab. There's Arabic-speaking people, because mm -hmm. the Arabs are made up of total amount of different tribes and bands of people. So the real politically correct thing would say to the Arabic speaking people or people who subscribe to Islam, uh, but if these people are direct descendants from their mothers of Jews, they're technically still Jews. There was one a case in um, Majorca outside of Spain. There was an island of Moranos that recently uh, said who they were. They were all able to join the Jewish people without converting. Other people from the, the Murano stuff, they couldn't prove their, their, you know, too much of the family tree. They had to do a symbolic conversion. Uh, but this one whole island of people didn't have to convert, and they were living as Christians for hundreds of years. Um, but they, oh, they kept every family record intact, because they took it that serious. 
Um, so now let's go a little bit farther down the Silk Road. <coughs> We're in Afghanistan. The interesting thing is, across the Silk Road, Three major cultures and or religions were formed within a hundred years of the tribes going across to the Far East. This is the Pashtun, this is Buddhism, and this is Shintoism in Japan. All of them founded in the same exact years, all based on spiritual principles. So, you know, one year people are offering their, God, their kids to the gods on the mountaintops to get rain, and all of a sudden the next year they're talking about nirvana and, you know, reaching a state of mind called, uh, we call in Hebrew, nachat, nachat ruach, you know, clarity of the mind, etc. This is what their religions are based about. Now, the Shinto Empire, which is founded, you know, within a hundred or so years of the tribes going east, they claim, this is a, a 70 million people in Japan, uh, in the Shinto culture, the oldest monarchy in the world, meaning the oldest line of kings in the world is the J Japanese Shinto culture, dates back to within the first king within a hundred years of the tribes going to the Far East. They claim to be a chosen nation, exiled from a homeland, who reestablished the kingdom in Japan. They have a holy temple that they have, their grand temple, on Mount Moriah, Mount Moria. In, uh, on their mountain in Japan, where they have three chambers to their temple, an outer chamber where people come and celebrate, an inner chamber where priests do sacrifices, and an inner chamber where they keep an ark on four poles with these golden birds on them, and they keep three things in their ark. And they have a festival where they take the ark out and they dance with it and they hold it by the poles. All the priests in Japan around this temple, they wear it, instead of square, it's circle, phylactery looking boxes, and they wear four cornered garments with tassels, and they blow these chauffeur horns every day. If anyone wants to go look at the Japanese alphabet, it looks nothing like Chinese or Mandarin or their neighbors. It very much resembles the, the Hebrew alphabet you know, on multiple layers uh, with many different examples. Uh, so this, these are just, I'm going, we don't have a you know, few hours to go into this, but this is, I'm giving an overhead view of all this stuff. Um, so the Japanese right now are also reaching out to the Jewish people and asking for it to be involved. I'll tell you a great little story right in here. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a super story. Uh, so one time I'm on Twitter, you know, trying to find Japanese people and talk to them, make all these relationships. And I found someone who was from the royal family, uh, somewhat descended from the royal family. And he was really posting a lot of stuff about this. So I said, hey, let me connect to him and be friends with him. And he said he wants to come to Israel. I didn't know who he was, really. He said he wants to come to Israel and take a tour. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll show you around, no problem. And he said, fine, I'll meet you in the airport. And he said, okay. This was a few weeks before. He said, uh, what's the itinerary? What can we map out the days? And only did I learn after that the Japanese people are all very meticulous about itineraries. They like to know what they're doing very much in advance. This is it's not an insult to them. It's just the way they are. They're much better in life if I lived that way. Um, so I said, it, that's not the way it always works in Israel. I said, you just kind of have to show up, and Israel has an agenda for you. We're going to just figure it out. And he said, okay. You know, he came. He met me in the airport, a young Japanese guy my age. We became friends. Where are we going to sleep this night? I wasn't sure. We, we figured out and it ended up working out. We stayed by this re researcher's house, this rabbi. We, we made it around. Then it came time for Shabbos. It's Friday afternoon. He says, where do you want to go? I said, I don't have a clue. He says, okay. So we're walking around in the shuk here and there. And a friend calls me. He says, hey, I'm going to my other friend's farm for Shabbos. You want to come? I said, perfect. So I said, we're going to a farm, you know? So we're in the car. I'm driving up and we're going into the West Bank. And he says, ooh, the West Bank. I heard about this place. It's a little scary. I said, don't worry about it. Now we're driving up. We go into a community called Itamar which was just recently in the news at the time for a terrorist attack. And he got a little more, you know, nervous. He said, okay, we're okay. And then, like, we're in a gated it tomorrow. Then we leave it tomorrow, and we're, like, super deep into the, into the mountains over there on the front lines. And we end up at a, a beautiful community on a hill called Sheva, Sheva, Sheva. It doesn't have a name. It has a number to it. And there's, you know, a few families there holding down space with their sheep, and they're really on the front lines. And we're sitting there, and I brought a, I brought a lot of wine for Shabbat. I said, let's drink wine and enjoy. And they're sitting out there. <clears throat> And down in the valley, they have another tent with a few people trying, you know, holding land and monitoring the sheep and monitoring the land. And Friday night, no one's drinking wine. I go, what's going on? No one's drinking wine. You know, I'm trying to drink wine here. And then I realize at the end of the meal, why? They start to divide night duty shifts for everyone at the table who's going to be on guard. Because they live, like, serious, you know? And so I said, okay, you know. So me and my Japanese friend, his name was uh, Matsumoto, we, we get uh, a 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. shift. You know, I'm from New York City. I never really did a guard duty shift in my life. I came to, I made Aliyah already past the time of being accepted to the army. They, they wrote me a letter that I wasn't welcome. And so I didn't have any real uh, formal training. So we wake up, he's got a, you know, a knife in his hand and I have a rock and we're walking around just making sure everything's safe. Thank God, we, you know, we got really scared. There was one fox that like scared the lights out of us. But otherwise we, we made it through the shift, we went back to bed. The next day during lunch, all of a sudden we hear they have walkie talkies. We hear in the walkie-talkie, someone's calling for code red backup, help. The guy in the, in the tent down below is getting attacked by the, the Palestinian neighbors. 
and all of a sudden we start to hear gunshots in the background, and he's go code red. And I saw, more, first of all, one of the most beautiful things in my life, uh, a somewhat Jewish militia assembled within a minute or two from like all the neighboring mountaintops, people on Jews on horses with swords and guns flying down mountaintops and people on ATV. It was like a homemade thing. It just starts going to the front line. I have all these kids next to me playing around. The mothers are next to their kids with sniper rifles, you know, looking around. The kids are playing. They didn't care. And all of a sudden, there's a, a fire that gets lit. Uh, the Palestinians lit, lit a fire. And it starts coming towards the, the kids and the houses. It starts coming up the mountain very rapidly. So they started to go into the next level preparations. They had these shovels that you smack and put out the fire. So they, everyone, uh, they hand everyone shovels and they go, and the, and the IDF eventually ends up coming and they, they work together with the Jews in the region to help, uh, you know, put out the fire. And so they give uh, me and Matsumoto, my friend, they give us a, a thing and bottles of water to bring down to put out the, to give to the firefighters to drink because you can get dehydrated down there. And so my friend's wearing his Japanese robe and his Japanese slipper sandals. I don't know if anyone knows these traditional ones. And it's like a steep mountain to go. He was hopping down that thing like a ninja. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, you know, I'm like Uchi and owing. I'm like trying to get down. He was, I couldn't, he was like trained for it. He's hopping down. Finally, we get down. He, I see this Japanese guy giving water to the soldiers. We ended up putting out the fire and the, and the day, you know, went, went by. And that was the, really the whole basic story. Shabbat went. So I come back to that community uh, a few years later and to visit them again. And they say, we have to tell you something. Before that incident and after that incident, there was n nothing like that ever happened. They said, everyone here talks about the time that the guy from the Lost Tribe's royal family in Japan came here and stirred up this whole entire energy in the region. And we're, never gonna, we're, we're not going to forget it. It was something very special. And so I said, okay, now this is, uh, this is serious stuff, because that was the land of Yosef, that northern region. So he came, who knows how many thousands of years before his bloodline may have been in this region or someone from that family. And uh, he invoked some type of serious uh, energy aggression. Right. These are so I, I have awesome stories like this that we haven't really ever told them yet. So this is the first time really relating this. I'm happy you guys enjoyed it. Yes, you have a question? No, it's not a question. It's Please. a comment. As you possibly know, in spite of the fact that the Japanese committed the most appalling atrocities against the Chinese, yes. as regards the Jews, they were on the whole very liberal. And I mean, it's true in Shanghai, which was under Japanese control during the Second World War, it wasn't easy for the Jews, but it wasn't anything like what happened in Nazi Europe. And when the Nazis sent out a senior SS officer to try and persuade the Japanese to set up concentration camps, the Japanese refused. Hmm. That's interesting, yeah. Uh, you are right about some atrocities, and you're also right about they were very kind to Jews. I would like to just mention that the tribes of Israel, when they left Israel, they were, they were called Ovde Avodah Zarah. They were idol worshippers as well. And they, the tribes of Israel in the north weren't the most righteous people. They were, you know, they separated from the Holy Temple. They were serving the golden calf in the north. Um, you know, there may have been murder and bloodshed. So we don't know. We, we had, you know, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. We had these sages. We had Rabbi Akiva. We had great, great sages that kept us alive during the exile who held on to the Torah. The Torah kept us alive. When the tribes of Israel scattered, they didn't have the light of the Torah that we had. But that's a different, there's different reasons why. There's different levels of exile. There was a spiritual exile and physical exile. Um, <clears throat> we went into more of a physical exile. They went more into a spiritual exile because our light of the Torah has yet to diminish. Um, thank God. We could trace from today every single rabbi, that's what Smicha, every single rabbi all the way to Moses, we could trace every single generation, every single rabbi who was in, in this path, in this line. If there's one other group of humans today that could do that, Believe you me, we would be the first people to study that line and read every work that they had to say and see how it matched up with ours. But uh, so till date, we're the only, the only people who have that, um, that known line. So we covered kind of the Silk Road, and that's where you find the B'nai Menashe also. People say, how'd they get out to Northeast, uh, in Northeast India? Well, if you, look at the, if you look at the map, you have you know, Afghanistan, and they're traveling. Uh, you, you have there right below uh, China and the India region, and you have Japan. You kind of see like a, a path that they traveled, and then cultural shifts that happen along those times. So as this global Israelite, Israelite uh, let's call it uh, the Commonwealth, starts to form, then you're going to start seeing these people are going to start surfacing and revealing the legends that their ancestors had told them. I'd like to go into one more big, big identity thing, which is going to involve politics in America. Excuse me. You have, now we mentioned you have the Igbo tribe. Has anyone ever been in a Times Square or a New York City where you have uh, the, the African-American Hebrew Israelites who stand on the street corners and yell at you saying, we're the real Jews, we're the real he uh, Hebrews, and you're a fake. And well, this is what they do. If anyone goes to New York, and, and almost in any city, actually, there's co people standing in corners yelling at Jews or yelling at white people, saying that you are imposters. We are the real people of Israel. 
And so most Jews end up battling them, you know, yelling at them, you this and that. So, you know, so I, I looked into it a little bit, and it turned out to me that uh, a tremendous percentage of the transatlantic slave trade came from the Igbo tribe, the number one tribe in Africa that claims to be Jews, made up a large percentage of the transatlantic slave trade. So there's no smoke without a fire. So now these people are claiming to be from the Israelites. This is not just a hocus pocus conspiracy theory that they're coming through. Their blood literally, and they're not even basing what they feel on the Igbo. They're not saying because we come from the Igbo, that's who we are. They're just saying this is who we are. We know it. We've, we've looked at the prophecies. We've looked at the curses. This is who we are. We are them. And, and then so I come in, I'm trying to explain, and a lot of them do talk about this, but the general, this is not their connection. I say, hey, you have the Igbo tribe in Nigeria, you guys came from them, this whole thing. So one time I was in uh, New York, uh, I was in Israel actually, in Yeshiva Eish, HaTorah, and I gave a lecture on the lost, called the Lost Tribes of Israel and the Purpose of Reality on YouTube. We're going to quantum physics and the sin of Adam and Eve and what the re implications of that were and what, why that has to do with the Lost Tribes of Israel, why the tribes got lost, how they return, all that I covered in it. But in that lecture, I spoke about the Igbo Nigeria and the African American transatlantic slave trade for about four something minutes. Someone took from that video, they cut that video, they clipped it, and they put it on their social media Facebook page. Within about a few days, combined between two or three different channels, it had about a million views within two or three days. So I was looking at the analytics of this, it was all African Americans viewing it. There was it was basically it, and they were all somewhere commenting with very words of endearment, some were words of hate, you know, this imposter Ashkenazi Jew who, you know, speaking about us, finally he's admitting, you know, who the real people of Israel were. So they're kind of taking my words out of context, but also, and so then I'm doing my thing, uh, you know, I'm continuing to live my life, and I'm at Mishmar one night, you know, just singing and then uh, learning Torah, and I get a phone call, and it's these uh, guys from New York, uh, these Hebrew Israelites, that's what they call themselves, and they said, hey, Rabbi, we got a guy who wants to debate you, our, our greatest debater uh, in the community. And he wants to debate you because he actually believes that the African Americans are the descendants of the, the Egyptian schools of mysticism and that the Hebrew religion is ripped off of the African religion and they want to and they want to go into a whole debate. And so the next thing I know, we, I, the whole entire thing stirred up and I said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll debate you, I don't have a problem. Then the, ne the next day, I look at social media, and all over these flyers and videos about the big, great debate with the rabbi coming in from Israel to beat the guy. And I said, wow, this got out of control real quick. And, you know, my friends will tell me, you should not be doing this. It's, it's, in, a, it's in a big ballroom in Harlem. There's going to be thousands of people there. Oh, yeah. And I said, look, I'm, you know, I'm not going to back out. I gave my word I'm going to come, so what am I going to do? I said, I'm just going to walk right in there. And some of my friends wanted to come bring popcorn like it was going to be, a, you know, a movie. And uh, another one of my friends said, listen, uh, you can't bring any Jews there. I'm sorry to tell you that. If you want to go, I'm gonna, we're going to get you bodyguards, um, but no, the condition is no other Jews can go. I said, okay, you know, that's reasonable, it's a good trade. So I got, I got a few bodyguards, which um, I don't know if I would have ended up needing it or not, but uh, at the end of the day, I feel like it was good to have. And there was no other Jews there, and I'm in a big ballroom with, you know, a thou thousand something, you know. Half the people hated me and were angry at me. A few of them loved me because I was verifying their story, and there's people looking to make peace and etc. And so basically I was, I, I'm not going to have time to speak into this now, it's another lecture we'll get to, but I was able to go into a much deeper level of the mysticism of ancient Egypt and the mysticism of Israel and showing how the, that school of mysticism existed way before the Egyptians. This is from the time of Adam through Noah and his, and his children, Shem Ever, and showing how the people of Israel were free, uh, free sourcing, ba basically opening up spirituality for the world, as opposed to where Egypt kept it in a tier system where you had the God or ruling over the man. And I kind of, you know, I really gave it to them hard. I really put it into perspective. And from there, there was a, a great unity, I felt, uh, between myself and these communities around America, which is a tremendous amount of them, of they call Hebrew Israelites, of now practicing Hebrews of the descendants of the transatlantic slave trade. And it's not just people. This is very high-profile celebrities and leaders who are taking this upon themselves and getting involved in this. So, the, so as far as America goes, the, what you're going to see is a, a tremendous resurfacing of a Jewish identity. Uh, but it's going, to have, we're, it's going to be a lot of work to see how we're going to come together and, uh, and unify. Um, uh, very, very interesting. I'd like to just <clears throat> deepen on that uh, subject for a second. 
So uh, there was a 1960s, there was a community in America who took on this. This is already old. This is the early 1900s they started talking about this. A lady can, they probably, they never stopped talking about this because people who were getting beaten on these farms, these slave farms, were probably telling their grandchildren, hey, we're from the people of Israel. If you look at the names, first of all, they kept meticulous records, the slave ships. They kept great records of people's names and et cetera. A lot, almost all the Igbo names had the word uh, Yah in it, you know. Uh, and yeah, I looked at the list and I said, wow, this is crazy. They all had the word Yah in it, you know. And so when uh, it's, this is what they're telling the grandkids. In the 1960s, there was a community in uh, Chicago who said, one of their leaders said, I had a vision. I'm taking my community of Israelites, and we're, we're getting out of here, and we're going to Israel. And what they did was they packed up their bags. They got enough money to get plane tickets to Liberia. Because in Liberia, you get free, I believe you get free citizenship if you were descendants of the transatlantic slave trade. So they all pick up. They go to Liberia. And the leader of this, these people sold, he knew a, a, a good ice cream recipe. He made and sold enough ice cream to pay for everyone's ticket and the whole thing to Israel. And they just showed up in Israel, kind of unannounced, in Tel Aviv with the suitcase. said, we're here, we're home, we're the Israelites. And the government here was like, what's, go what's going on? And so they put him in these like temporary, you know, really bad living conditions. I think it was outside of Tel Aviv in these really cramped uh, old apartments and they were living really poorly but they you know they, they, they built up they, they grew a little bit and um, they really they really thrived and then they ended up working networking they whatever they're good at it they, they struck a deal with the mayor down in the Negev uh, by Demona to get a big plot of land and to create their own village so this was the 1960s uh, 19, early 1970s so they ended up getting land and they created what's called the village of peace right now or oh, if you go on ways, I think it's Kfar uh, Ha'ivrim or Kihilat Ivrim, like the, the village of Hebrews. And it takes you right to them. And they're actually one of the most beautiful communities I've ever seen in my entire life, as far as the whole entire community takes care of one another. There's no alcohol, there's no drugs, there's no poverty, they don't lock their doors, they, everyone's a vegan. Uh, they have their own birthing centers. I mean, maybe if you guys have a beer on the side, you know, I'm not judging. Uh, uh, well, they serve in the army. There's polygamy there. Yes, there's polygamy. Hey, I, I, you know, I'm not judging that. There's uh, some of our greatest ancestors that we, we pray to every day. Uh, they, had, they, they practice polygamy also. So, like I said, people come from different regions, different customs. The, the Gezeira, the rule that there shouldn't be polygamy anymore, was placed on a certain segment of the people of Israel and not the whole. Um, but uh, I agree. I think Adam and Eve is a big, you know, that, that like duality, the, the soul. So I, I hope we could return to to the Adam and Eve scenario and, and rectify that. So, um, as far as polygamy, first of all, they had a lot more women than guys. I don't know if they were polygamy, who they would marry at the time. I don't know if Ashkenazi Jews in Yeshiva were going to send their, their buffroom down there to marry their girls. Um, one day, I hope there will be a, a United, United Nation. Are they accepted Jews? Huh? Are they accepted Jews? So, politically, I don't believe they are. Um, they consider themselves uh, from the Hebrews. Um, call themselves the Black Hebrews. Yeah, that's uh, that's you know, the black. They go. They, I mean, the, the word black is not because some of them, you know, the Mishnah actually says in the Ga'im, I think the second parak, first Mishnah, it says the people of Israel were not white, and it says they were not black, but it says they were boxwood. What boxwood is? I don't know. You know, so some people in Nigeria look more boxwood than I look boxwood. Uh, I always explain how we got white. We, we don't know. It could have been King David, they say, was a redhead. And he, he had Moabite blood in him, maybe from, you know, from Ruth and she, they're from Sodom and the Sas, you know. We don't know the genetics of the Holy Ancient People of Israel, how white snuck into it and which bloodline survived. And when Uncleus converted, was he white and are we the descendants of him? But the most important thing, the color doesn't matter. And I promise you the people of Demona also would agree with me on that. Because they invite me down there and treat me very kindly um, as an equal, as a brother. And that's not, that's not, you know, and there's a new generation being born. It always takes a generation to, to filter out and, and re-identify and then how they're going to move forward. And so what I see them as is a beautiful example of what the African-American communities in America could look up to for what their future will be. Because right now the African-American community in America is in a tremendous state of, I don't know if it's been impoverishment, but they're, they're, they still feel like they're in warfare. Uh, that they're being persecuted, attacked, and from all different levels and angles. Whether it's right or wrong, we can't judge them because they were taken from their homeland on ships and they have to start their life over and be equals to everyone else. And, and there's all this type of discrimination. So, so back to the main picture, and, and there's one other region. Back to the main picture, I'm painting for you little by little because this is, we can't cover this in 40 minutes. Uh, this really needs like a, I actually have a course on this, an online course. 
Um, I'll give you information at the end. It's losttribes.education, www.losttribes.education. We can go through a whole entire course on this uh, and learn all about it. But in uh, South America also, in Portugal, you have about 7 million plus people who are descendants of the Anusim, of the Moranos, uh, from, the, from the Spanish Inquisition. So these are, we've spread to four corners of the earth. It's official. Uh, it's already happened. So the question is, if so, so what? What, what do we do about it going forward? And what I'd like to present as my solution is uh, this platform, the iTribe, where we're actually going to map everyone out, identify who's who, figure out what resources they need, and deliver them directly to those people without middleman organizations. Because right now there's a lot of middlemen between everyone in this room and the lost tribes of Israel. Think about it. If someone said to you, you know, we have the B'nai Menashe returned to Israel, it's really cool. If I said to anyone in this room, can you point to a map and show me where their village was? Or do you have one person in that village you could talk to and ask questions? I don't think anyone could say yes. Maybe you could say Mizra and Manipur. Can you show me their, their village? We don't know. So what's going on? How come we can't, you know, let's open source this. Where are, where are the people? How can we talk to them? How can we message them? How do I find out what they need? There has to, it's not enough to make one, one person or one organization standing in between these hundreds of millions of people and us here in the homeland who have all the resources. We have wealth and we have technology. Now it's on us to learn about this and activate this thing we call the, the Israelite Commonwealth. And uh, just, to, just to end, because, because uh, I know time, because we did end up getting land, um, we did end up getting land, thank God, was directly somewhat related to the beer company that we founded. It's a whole story that we'll need another hour for how it happened, but literally that vessel that we created, because we created that beer company, that was directly responsible for leading to the series of events that ended up getting us a, a huge chunk of land in the north, in the lower Galil. Actually, um, coincidentally, in the same exact location that Choma Omigdal, the Wong Tower Foundation, started from. Uh, and to get a little creepy, because it sounds already like too much, um, the name of our, my non-for-profit for, for this social network, the iTribe, which we created before we knew where we'd get land, is called Choma Omigdal, before we knew anything, yeah. So, we're, <laughs> this is my life calling. We're going to try to do 2.0 and scale Israel to the world. And uh, everyone here is definitely invited to come visit us up north on our land. And to, I hope to, at the end to collect everyone's email addresses and to follow up. And if you'd like to learn more about this, you can go to the website www.losttribes.education. And uh, I'd like to just take a minute before, before I wrap it up if anyone has any questions. I know a few people asked their questions, but you may have got it out. Um, is the heavy set? Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, you, you may mention that uh, some of the, um, the Palestinians have Jewish blood, there's a, a Jewish bloodline, the Christians as well. How about like, you know, there's so many Muslims in the world, and when like, uh, like uh, Muhammad went into villages, people also either killed them or they, they were converted. So is there any kind of research that was done that, is like, that identifies that a certain percentage of the Muslims in the world, or the, even the, and the Christians in the world, could really be uh, have Jewish backgrounds. Right. So right now, the only thing we have is people self-testifying. And uh, well, your question was, you know, we're talking about the hidden uh, Palestinian Muslim Jew, uh, Jews that are Arabs now in Israel. Um, how many people of the Muslim population around the world were once another religion, maybe Jewish, before they were forced to convert by yes. the Muslim yeah. Crusades? And the answer is really all we have now. Without, we don't want to be speculators and say, hey, you guys look like the lost tribes. We want to say who is saying they are the lost tribes, right? Who's coming out and saying it? So besides Afghanistan and the, the, the Muslims of Kashmir, you don't really have such large groups of people saying that. Except I did once hear that the family of uh, the Saudi family, a lot of people there uh, were once Jews, not from the lost tribes. And uh, Yemen, I also heard that there was a lot of uh, the, the Muslim families of Yemen were once Jews. But uh, that's speculation. Yes? There's other facts. Also Please. involved. For instance, when you put so much emphasis on Afghanistan, history has showed us that a lot of the Jews in Meshad, in Iran, had a, were forced conversions or had to practice Judaism secretly, and a lot of them moved to Afghanistan. Definitely. So we see a lot of the artifacts that they used, it wasn't lost trap, but it was the tradition just moving from one city to another city, in one country to another area. This is a great question. I actually, I come from Queens, New York, in a neighborhood that hosted the only Afghan Orthodox Jewish synagogue in America. And I would pray there regularly. It was just a coincidence that I was down, you know, down the block from them. 
And when I started learning about this lost tribe stuff, I, kind of, I spoke to them about it, and they said, yes, 100%, we knew about our, our Pashtun lost tribe's neighbors, they were so nice to us, and we had trades, and they called each other, you know, brothers from the same family. And uh, so actually one day I brought from the Voice of Afghanistan TV station, I brought reporters to that synagogue, and they uh, interviewed them, and they had a whole dialogue that they're coming back together, and they, they broadcasted it on cable TV in Afghanistan, showing look, our brothers, our Jewish brothers from Afghanistan didn't forget us, they're still, so there was, uh, a separation between who the Jews were and who the ten tribes were in Afghanistan all throughout the whole time. And even with the Afghans, they had different, they had the ten tribes and the royal family of Afghanistan, which were ruled for a long time, was not from the ten tribes, they were the family of Benjamin. And the ten tribes wanted them to rule over them because their rulers claimed descent from uh, Melech Shaul, from King Saul. And so I'm actually friends with some of the descendants of the royal family. They're in exile in America right now, very vocal about who they are. And there was a whole coup with American politics, and the royal family was, uh, they had to flee. So uh, there, there is, like you said, there's going to be more information to be clarified on that. That's a, that's a good question. Yeah. Great presentation. I, I philosophically and ideologically with you. Uh, but I wanted to present a challenge and then a question. Please. In Sanhedrin 110b, Rabbi Kiva says, just as the day has disappeared and shall not return, so the lost ten tribes have disappeared and shall not return. That's the question. How would you address Rabbi Akiva if you were sitting in the room? The second question is, if you had $20 million, and hypothetically, you could help a Kohen who was tricked by a lost tribe in China and lost a million dollars, or uh, people that are very far, very far away from Judaism, who would you give that first uh, $200,000 to? So you're saying there's a halacha question about helping a Jew before helping someone who's a non-Jew. That's, that's really your question over there. Um, I would say that the people I'm referring to have a status of Zeri Yisrael, which is a different halachic status than a non-Jew. Um, so we'd have to ask a posik, but it's a good question. My, uh, to answer your first question, which I'm glad you asked, because I've actually thought about this, and I've never really said this publicly before. It's not so fair, because you didn't say the second opinion of the Mishnah. <clears throat> he was saying there's a Mishnah that has an opinion. Rabbi Akiva says uh, the ten tribes of Israel don't return. Just like the sun, you know, it says the sunset, they don't, that's it, they're gone. But I think it was Rabbi Eliezer, right, who says they do return. Uh, most of the time we hold back Rabbi Akiva when it comes to these things. There's a third opinion. Rabbi Shimon said only if they do true, according to... The okay, it's interesting. I want to suggest... Um, Wait, good question. Is that saying returning to... Here, like the land, or is that returning to the returning to the fold? Oh, so here, so here, I'm saying. If, they, if, they're, if they're sitting up shop and saying yeah. locally and saying this is now part of Israel. So according to the opinion that they return, they return to their religion and their faith. According to the opinion that they don't return, they're not returning geographically, but they're staying where they were. And that's the context that each one was speaking. This is a terrace that I thought of, an answer that I thought of a year or two ago that. I don't know if it's the right or wrong, but according to Gemara logic, it could work. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It, works out, it works out because Rabbi Akiva basically said, well, the, the question was, how can Rabbi Akiva say such a thing if the prophecy says they're coming back? And he says, because they already did return. Right. So those few that returned with Jeremiah, whereas the rest would be in your category. There's also one verse, which is an amazing verse. I don't have it offhand right now, um, but I could, if everyone wants to follow up me. It says where the lost tribes were, I think, Chabor uh, uh, and, and these regions, which are, we, we say in Afghanistan, the end of the verse says, until this day. So it says these tribes were exiled until this day. Now we all know in this room what until this day means in the Torah. And still today, Hayom. It says still they are there. Um, so we don't know if they're going to leave. This could be that somewhere they stay and they have global Israel. I want to be able to take a high speed train to Kabul for a business meeting and back in the same day to tuck my kids in. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think that's far fetched. Do you have a question? Or are you just stretching? No peer pressure. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Are you in touch with Sima Sinai about the uh, Jewish roots of Palestinians? The second question is, uh, you, you outlined uh, an amazing uh, vision, which is different than the current political visions. Are you in touch with the foreign ministry and the Sukhmut, for example? What is their take? So, um, I have been in touch with Sima Sinai. I tried to reach out to every single professor in the whole industry to learn He's about... He's a professor. Yeah, he, he uh, self-identified. He, uh, he became... Uh, 
If you can. He's a researcher. I say, anyone who does research and does what he did, read, read a few books, I'll, I'll, I'll give him covered and throw the name out there. But I guess you're right. I don't know who gets what uh, degrees. And uh, he basically wrote a book saying, uh, Brother Shall Not Lift Sword Against Brother, which was about uh, all the, the Jewish families and clans in Israel who identify the, the Muslim ones, who identify as Jews, their history, where they were. And actually, I looked at my map, his theory is right, a lot of them create this line down the middle on the mountains, you know, and they, it shows after a long time they fled to the mountaintops. It was actually interesting, also in the, in the Tanakh, there's a verse that says, not all of the people were exiled from the land. There was a remnant that stayed to be the caretakers of the, of the vines and the grape caretakers. Now, the, one of the main families in uh, the village of Yatta, which uh, obviously we've had terrorists come through, is the, I think the Mahmura clan, which means winemakers. You know, what Muslim is going to be the winemaker family? It's, it's haram, it's forbidden for Muslims to drink wine. So, who were you when you were the winemaker? When was that? You know, and they, they are the ones who identify. They're the, they're the ones under their floorboards, have old books with, with Hebrew in it, have slots in their doors for mezuzo, Jewish stars, etc. So, um, that's, and the second thing is regarding the foreign ministry, etc. I'm very, uh, what I do is still very low key. Um, it's not really out there known mm -hmm. in the world yet. It's still a lot of work and infrastructure. But there has been interest from certain periphery people attached to certain ministries uh, to learn about this. Because Israel does have a Ministry of Diaspora uh, branch that they haven't had so much success with. And they're still looking to see what's the next phase of keeping outreach with the people around the world who have this identity. So uh, I have very serious political aspirations. I would like to take this to a very high uh, political level where there's rulers and leaders from different nations congregating in Israel themed to creating a global Israel. Um, you know, putting all, you know, no games, you know, this is, uh, Israel today is, uh, is a one, uh, first of all, the biggest blessing in the world, the fact that we have Jewish people uh, protecting us, you know, in our own homeland, it's, it makes me emotional every day, I can't even tell you how, how grateful I am for it, but where we are now has still not embraced the identity of uh, being a prophetic people, of what has to happen in order to usher in an era of world peace. That's like a foreign concept to our identity. You don't open the newspaper every day and read, you know, what are we, how are we getting closer to these prophecies, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, so I'd like to help bring that back to the fold. Uh, one sec. Yeah, yeah. I just got to you, so I'll go to you. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how deep your research is. I'd be interested to know, you know, the breadth of it. Um, but I'll give two suggestions. I made. Mm -hmm. One is linguistics. Mm -hmm. There's linguistic professors who talk in written books about people and movement and areas all based on linguistics. Right. One is a Barilan professor, Bernard Spolsky, who's written more books than anybody else. And there was um, a book, I, I read a few books by a professor, I think it was Joseph Edelberg, about uh, the Japanese language and the Hebrew language and how it passed from Israel to Japan and what evolutions it went through and etc. Um, but I agree with you. Definitely more research needs to go in. I'm a young guy and I'm, I feel like I'm a humanitarian servant. So I, didn't, I don't necessarily have all the time in the world yet. I don't have all the time in the world to do all the research, but I'm like, hey, there's humans out here who are reaching out to us who are saying this is who they are and they're in code red, you know? So we gotta act. And there's a couple guys here mm -hmm. in Jerusalem who have gone off to different tribes in Africa trying to find a Masoret to see about kosher animals. Definitely. Now, they also were looking at lost tribes or remnants right. of tribes. There's another tribe in Africa, I believe there's a called the Lemba tribe. It's in South Africa. And when Israel became a state, they wrote a letter to Israel asking for the right of return. And everyone kind of laughed at them, you know, you're trying to jump on the bandwagon, you know, first world country, third world country. Everyone kind of laughed at them. A professor from Duke went down there and did DNA research and showed 10% of this tribe had the Kohen gene. 10% of them were Kohanim. Um, this is also not a secret. I really encourage everyone to research this after they get, when they get home. And so, yeah, these places in Africa do exist with these Misoras, and there are independent people doing different things, which is why I was trying to create an umbrella so that could all be organized content. And one last point. Please. When people did move, for instance, the exile from Spain to Holland, from Holland they went to like Suriname and New Guinea and Papua New Guinea, they would call their areas on Jewish names. They called it uh, Jewish Savannah or they call the area the Carmel or the Golan. Mm. So sometimes the names came from abroad trying to replicate rather than inside reaching out. That makes total sense. You see, like, I think it was in the, the Saudi desert, there's like a, something uh, Al-Yahud, like the desert Al-Yahud, you know, the Jew, the, where the Jewish desert was. So uh, I definitely think we named names. They say, um, like, uh, Kandahar, even, where in Afghanistan is, 
where these big mountains are, they say Kandahar, here is the mountain, in, uh, in Aramaic, Kandahar. Um, so a lot of the names can get assessed like that. That's why the, the prophecy says you'll find the lost tribes by the river by the river Chabor, and they say by Khyber, that's where they all are today, Khyber, Chabor. People align all these things, but I'm at the point where we have enough information in front of us to make movements and not sit here and say it's cool or to speculate on it, be like, wow, so exciting. What are we going to do about it now? We have to, as a generation, as a nation, uh, do something. Yeah. What would you like to do in the next 10 years? What would I like in to do? In what steps? I would like, uh, so my, my model is right Your now. Your business model. Yes. Yeah. I have uh, an online course on this uh, Lost Tribes of Israel, which is college accredited. Um, I have college accreditation. That's my business. So it means people could receive three college credits for learning about everything we just spoke about tonight. And they pay for it because it's college credits, it has a value. And with money I make, obviously I'd like to take care of my family. But I would like to be creating a funnel to give back into mapping out uh, to the non-for-profit side. I would like within the next 10 years to, to make capital there and map out every single place in the world where you have the tribes of Israel. Have community and content managers basically create the Facebook for the lost tribes of Israel where we're going to scale Israel that way. I'd like to see a global Israel with world peace. You can, you can call me a dreamer, but I, you know, I think every single human in this room should have their own map or vision that they think they should contribute to get to that goal. I've created mine, and I'm humbly going to try for it. If I don't succeed, you know, I'm going to enjoy the ride. I have good friends, but uh, we're, this is what I'd like to do in the next... What do you see after the 10 years, let's say, whatever it is, after you have a map? Well, now you're talking about the Gula. I hope that the Gula comes. The, in, the, in the time of the redemption, we say the practical difference between the redemption and the non-redemption non is the, the yoke of the nations are off of our shoulders. Uh, so this is basically what we're trying to do. We're trying to get all the middlemen out of our lives, uh, which includes, you know, uh, things like we would have had 100 years ago. Had Nikolai Tesla gave us the free wireless electricity, and we didn't have middlemen organizations making coals and uh, for-profit companies and wars over... You know, they, this was an example of nations on our shoulders. There's middlemen between us and our resources, and that tax us and work us, and we're in their system. Uh, if we could free ourselves from there, we can grow in spirituality. I know that there's a lot of dormant parts of the mind right now, and a lot of new uh, methods out there are helping people, you know, re-embrace who they are, what they call mindfulness or whatever it is. People have today what we call in Egypt, katsar ruach, a shortness of breath, where people really have no clue who they are. They live day to day just trying to make it to the end of the day. They're very stressed. Um, you know, we're, we're not healthy as far as humans goes. We're healthy as far as our riches, our physicality, but our, our, st our mental state as humanity today is very poor. So I hope that will increase, and this would be maybe the time of the redemption. Now, we say that the redemption has to come, right? We all know that by the year uh, 6,000, according to the timeline. Every day of creation is 1,000 years to come. And so we're, you know, 200, uh, I think, 33 years away, uh, 223 years away. I'm not good at math so much. And um, from this time, and we believe there's also, just like the Jewish people let make an early Shabbat, the great redemption will come in early. So 10 years from now, I think there's already Yotermi died. It's way too much. I'm optimistic. I think this whole thing could uh, wrap up within a year if we're strategic about it. You know? uh, people, I, I forgot, it was a video in... Um, I think in 2012 or something, it was called Coney 2012, I don't know if anyone remembers it. It was about this African tyrant in Africa, and he was killing people, and some people had an idea how to save the village, and they made a video and a, call, and a campaign and a call to action, and it got like, I don't know, like 70 million views in like a day or two. Guy raised a ton of money, and it, supposedly the, the creator of this project uh, snapped, it got too much for him, he lost his mind, and he went insane, like to an insane asylum. But I said, wait, wait a minute. I said, some young guy in California can have an idea to help save a village in Africa, could raise, uh, you know, can get all these millions of dollars, 70 million people to view it in, in a day or two. I said, the Gula can come, the redemption can come in a matter of days. It just depends how we package it and present it. And this, we need divine providence and the right team. But uh, this is why I'm coming out here speaking to you guys tonight, and we're going to keep the, the voice alive for it. Yeah? Uh, you spoke uh, mostly about uh, a group of people that moving to Israel. Israel and uh, they identify as Jews and uh, or have Jews habits. You think that the trend of uh, uh, maybe single people that want to convert and return to Israel, but they don't have like uh, they are not mm, born in a Jewish environment, but maybe a Jewish roots. Uh, you think that the, these two trends can be um, like uh, is the same trend or are two different? No, the the people who are converting to uh, Jewish roots are I think a different category. First of all, we say a convert is not a convert. 
His uh, soul was at Mount Sinai. Once they convert, we say their soul was at Mount Sinai. They're simply rejoining. But uh, that's how we almost, I think we officially believe that's the case. Um, I think if someone wants to convert and move to Israel, no one should stop them and get in their way. If someone from Nigeria or someone from Afghanistan wants to convert and learn the mitzvah and do everything, and he wants to move to Israel, who could stand in his way? But what I'm saying is we are not going to try to convert them, and we're not going to try to bring them to Israel. But you, it's not in our hands to stop people from seeing the beauty of the Torah and wanting to take it upon themselves. So if, if you know someone on that journey, you tell them to keep going strong and make it to the homeland. You know? That's, that's the whole thing. Yeah? Um, I agree with another point you made really strongly about, um, for example, Palestinians that are turned away and wanted to appeal to become part of the nation and they were turned away in parallel to Timna coming to Avraham Avinu and wanting to join mm. and giving rise to Amalek. Maybe Avraham Avinu oh. would maybe go back and do that day over. Uh, but, um, so, and which mentioned, mentioned therapy. Are there particular models of therapy that you've looked at or you consulted with people that understand the process of getting from a person from maybe acting out with anger to, to integrating and <coughs> grieving and being able to, you know, because it's a system. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a system that's perpetual. I mean, uh, you had to go there. You're just pushing my buttons. Uh, you asked um, if we're talking about the Palestinians who were once Jewish and they want to reconvert and the terrorism and the whole thing. I like what you said about the connection with when... Uh, when, uh, when Avram was reapproached, by her name was referred to a Timna at the time, right? Yes. Uh, to join back, and she was denied. It created Amalek, this, um, this nation that hated the Jews. Are we in a similar situation today where these Palestinians tried to rejoin and we weren't allowing them in 1948, and now they hate us, but they're still now we could rejoin with them, but they need therapy. So what would be the ideal therapy? And uh, listen, this is where it can get a little controversial um, because I have my own ideas. I don't know if it'll scale. But uh, what I'm about to say right now is definitely backed by a few Gedolim of Israel already who signed off letters on this. This is not my opinion, but what I've seen already work, um, uh, you know, in articles and etc. Uh, what they would need, I would say, is a, called a neurological reset. Um, people have traumas in their, in their neurological pathways. For example, if there's a dog who bites someone when they're four years old, and now they're 14 years old and the dog barks, they're going to have a neurological uh, stimulation for fear. So there is, um, I'll be specific about the names, there are certain plant medicines out there that actually people can take and within a day reset their neurological pathways and heal them uh, from any pre-existing traumas to kind of give someone a fresh start. The name of this uh, medicine which is practiced in, uh, in the South, uh, South America would be called uh, ayahuasca. You see many celebrities, high profile... Ibogaine is a medicine used to reset the neurological pathways for people uh, with a heroin and uh, opiate addiction. Yeah, it, it, mostly it is used for uh, yeah, yeah. for uh, heroin. So if someone had a bad trauma, we would recommend he does uh, uh, a plant therapy called ayahuasca before ibogaine. If someone's overdosing and uh, first of all, if anyone knows about opiates or heroin, it's almost impossible to, with, uh, to get off that without withdrawal symptoms. Like you mentioned, there's a plant called Iboge, Iboga, which comes from the Gibbon region of Africa. If you take that, same day you can walk away without uh, clean from heroin, without any withdrawal symptoms, etc. And this is not new. There's a rabbi Gadolim in Israel who signed off letters on this, calling it Tichiyas Amesim. Uh, the Jewish community has been very supportive of this secretly for many years already. Um, thank God I, you know, I never had to know about it, but... But this is real. So this plant's ayahuasca, uh, which we can't get into too much because of the time constraint, certain chemicals involved in it have, have to do... Actually, I'll tell you very quickly. Uh, you, maybe you don't know this. We were talking about therapy, so I, was, I, re I recommend uh, ayahuasca for the Palestinians. Uh, I, I think it's probably the coolest idea in the world. I don't know how to, if I'll be received well or not for it, but I have no problem standing my ground and debating about it. Um, the main chemical of ayahuasca... Uh, is actually could be extracted from atze shitim, from acacia wood, uh, which is what the Israelites planted when they got to Egypt and stared at throughout their whole, the, the Rashi says they stared at it throughout their slavery in Egypt, and because of staring at it, they had faith that there would be the redemption. And they cut down the trees and took it into the Midbar with them. So the, ma the main plant of the people of Israel is uh, used around the world for these uh, re religious ceremonies, which basically flushes all of your neurological uh, traumas I in a matter of hours and lets you walk away a clean new person. So um, that's a new suggestion to the peace plan right there. If anyone uh, argues with you about two-state, one-state, you could send them to me. What? 
I just mean it's storing up a ton of sheep and wood to harvest it. Gotcha. Hey, listen. You tell, tell them to apply for the government for an approval to be a healing center. That would be the guy would be a, a cutting edge. If it's possible to do a neurological reset in a few hours, let's say, why do people go to psychiatrists? Um, the big, why do people go to psychologists if you do a neurological reset? Like, no, no, why, don't they, why do they keep going there clearly. if they could drink something and get to One of the over. biggest lobbyists in America is Big Pharma. Saying stuff like that could actually get me killed. Uh, it's very dangerous. But Big Pharma is the, I believe today it could be the number one lobbyist in America where pills is big business. So psychologists are pushing things for people who get paid. When you have doctors, doctors get people coming to their offices and giving them gifts and payoffs. Yeah. It's not just uh, medicine that doctor that they give, but therapy, which takes uh, two, three, four years, there, and it's a process. It doesn't have to guarantee any results. There is no therapy today without the pills. In America, uh, almost everyone is on uh, an anxiety <sighs> pill, an antidepressant yeah. pill, uh, because it comes from their therapist. So yeah. it starts with a therapy session, but then the therapist recommends these pills so you can cope with reality. But really, these pills numb you and take you away, and then, and then get you addicted. You can't get off the pills, and they have side effects. And you know, somewhere, someone's making a couple billion dollars off of this. Uh, so we're stuck in a... Oh, this is not a recreational thing. Most people who take it have no desire to ever do it again. This it is like... like something almost everybody can take. Because most people have trauma in their hey. life. Now you're thinking. That's great. Everybody yeah. Yeah. You're a genius. I would love if... Uh, I would, okay. I'd love for the world to be normal, but that could be a conversation one day, you know? When the Israeli government opens up a... Because, you know, celebrities in America are flying to South America to do it now, to just reset themselves from their drug addictions, from alcohol addictions. If Israel opened up one, you know, people... How many people spend hundreds of millions of dollars of tourism to come here and stick their foot in the Dead Sea just to get a little healing? Imagine if we could heal all your mental illness. The whole world's gone insane with mental illness. Imagine if we could help with that. And this is part of Israel being a light onto people. And uh, also the Vilna Gon says, in the future, the spirituality and the physicality merge into one. So when you start to see certain plants, and we don't have time to go into it now, but certain parts of the brain that get activated by it and have connected to it with Kabbalah, there's a, there's like, I can give a whole shear on, on what's going on with that. On, yeah. on the note of plants, uh, where, where do you find the, like, the most usage of uh, God? Yemenites, Ethiopians, Afghanis, and a little bit in Saudi Arabia, maybe? Right, that's an interesting point that uh, a lot of these the tribes in uh, Eastern Asia and Africa who are, are from the Jewish people chew God to uh, stay awake. It's a, it's a stimulant, so you know, for example... Um, but it's, not, it's not something hard. It's not something no, when I was in America, you know, the, uh, I was in college, what the culture in college was? The culture in college was uh, Adderall culture. Which means every college kid, uh, thank God I didn't need it, I'm, you see I'm an energetic person, I, I, don't need, I didn't need that to focus, but every single college kid almost takes these pills called Adderall so they could stay awake in class and do their homework and take their tests. So I said, okay, you know, I see that your body has a need for some type of stimulant to do that. I say, our brothers and cousins in Africa have this plant that they chew, which really doesn't have a withdrawal or side effects or whether you think it's natural, whether it's healthy or not, I don't know. But I see you're being fed a for-profit product made in a laboratory by a company that's benefiting off this. That's got, we got to figure that out and got to stop, you know. Why America makes, you know, tobacco and uh, alcohol legal, but not, a, not that, something like that. They, this is part of uh, a corruption that's going to unfold. They say with this generation, when we look back at it, they'll say the biggest issue of this generation was the for-profit companies who had a say in how humans medicated and uh, took care of themselves. There should be zero for-profit interest in, that, in, that, in these industries of mindfulness and health. Um, so this is part of my political platform. Thank you. Any other questions? Go ahead, last one, and then we'll do a round. Okay, we can do a round. I'll ask you after. No, you okay? We'll get the question. We'll get the question. What's the question? I uh, built a lot of momentum here tonight and found some support and mentioned about keeping things rolling. Maybe just say how good ways to keep it rolling. Right. Or, or a source sheet, maybe for the websites you mentioned. So yeah. First of all, on a personal note, I would like everyone before we leave to, if you could write down your email in the back so I could just stay in touch with you and send updates in case you want. If you don't want, you just let me know. You won't hear from me again unless you read about something maybe a few years down the line in the newspaper. And secondly, um, I'll tell you now, but I can tell you at the end in person, I have an online course dealing with this whole entire topic from Adam and Eve until this great redemption uh, titled www.losttribes.education. And uh, you can find the whole kit and caboodle there. And if there's any questions on that, there's a way you can ask questions and it comes right to me. And uh, I'll be glad to help. And if you know anyone who needs, who needs college credits, definitely, definitely let them know. Just bachelor's or master's? Bachelor's degree.
Good question, though. Mm -hmm. We're good. Kosher.